Today we're going to talk about writing the clinical study report. I'm an independent consultant medical writer. I have been writing clinical study reports for over 20 years. So hopefully I'll be able to give you a lot of good information today. All right, some of the objectives that we're going to talk about today, how we're going to turn the protocol and the subsequent data into clear, concise submission documents. We'll talk about the elements for the clinical study report and the appendices. We'll learn a little bit about differentiating the various types of statistical outputs and how you handle those data. We'll talk about the phases of drug development, their differences and similarities, especially as they relate to writing clinical study reports. And we'll talk about style guides and templates, which are a big issue. Writing style. The most important thing to remember when you're writing a regulatory document is who is the end user, who is your audience. If you're familiar with writing protocols, ultimately the primary end user is the clinical site that's going to be conducting the study. Now you've got all these data, and there's a whole different approach for the clinical study report. It's really not based on what the site wants. It's more based on what you want to communicate to the regulatory authorities. Here in the U.S., we go through the Food and Drug Administration, as you're, I'm sure, aware. We have CEDAR for drugs, CEBRA for biologics, and CDRH for devices and diagnostics. There may be other national authorities if you're doing global studies, so you need to be familiar with what they look for as well. If you're working with a CRO, or maybe you are a CRO, very often CROs either write the reports for sponsors or will review them if they've been part of the study process. Site personnel also may review the study report. With every document, there are internal reviewers. And so the thing that's critical to remember about writing any regulatory document is that everyone has the same takeaway message when they walk away from it. So it shouldn't matter what their background is, whether or not they're the primary end user, but if, if it's written properly, everyone will have the same takeaway. A few critical issues about writing style. You want to make sure you use terminology that's familiar to your audience. You want to write to inform rather than impress. The formatting and style of your template and your document is just as important as the content that goes in it. People do forget about this. I know when I first started writing, I didn't really think about formatting as an issue. For me, it was all about content. However, standardization of your process is really important, and having the proper styles embedded so your tables of contents can be automatically updated, et cetera, are all very critical. You should always use a template. If you don't have one or your client doesn't have one, it's a good idea to recommend it or to generate one. You should understand linking, especially if you're doing uh, electronic submissions, because linking is really the critical issue. And you always want to have someone uh, quality control your work. Style guides and templates. Let's talk about those. They're very important. Uh, style guides are company-specific guides that really contain basically all the rules for generating a document in your company. Sometimes different divisions have their own style guides, depending on the size of your company. Uh, sometimes they're company-wide. If you don't have a style guide, I recommend using the American Medical Association uh, Manual of Style. That's the standard in the industry. But what a style guide will do is help create standardization across all your documents within your submission and hopefully within your company. The end result is you have a very easy to read and well-organized document. Not only that, as, as the reviewers are looking at your documents throughout the life cycle of your product, they're all going to look the same. And that's very helpful in the review process. The style guides can have a ton of information, from anywhere from margins, uh, especially if you're doing a paper submission, to things like heading styles, common terms, et cetera. It can be endless. I've seen them that are, uh, style guides that are five pages long, and I've seen style guides that are 150 pages long. And as a medical writer, I can tell you we have a lot of conversations about style. We can have conversations for two hours about whether or not there should be one or two spaces between a period and the next sentence. <laughs> Uh, so these things are very critical to us uh, as perfectionists when we write. So it's just important to, uh, if, again, if you don't have a style guide, grab the AMA manual style. It's not even that expensive, and uh, or have some reference that you can use so that you standardize your documents. They'll look more professional, and review times will be improved. The template, this sort of goes hand in hand with the style guide, in my opinion. It's basically a step-by-step -step example of the formatting for your document. So uh, it's not necessarily an outline. I don't want you to confuse a template with an outline. A template should have instructions for what types of information should be included in each section. It should include standard and suggested text. Sometimes there's locked text, which has to do primarily with adverse events. So it's very important to have a well thought out and a well organized template. 